All right. So thank you very much, Kenneth Elvo, for being here today. I know we are all struggling with um, not having access to the same resources that we usually do. So I appreciate your time and effort figuring out Zoom with me uh, for a special edition of The Local Beat, as I have yet to do a quarantine session yet. So I'm pretty excited about that. And no, I don't expect you guys to play music. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, um, it's been a while since I've had the full band talking with me so if y'all could introduce yourselves that would be fantastic almost said phenomenal there good catch good catch um good catch <laughs> my name is ryan i'm i'm a i am the the band leader um and the tennis player number one um my name is chandler and i play bass and i'm i'm tennis tennis player number two but we tennis only because <laughs> a... i'm heather i play drums live <clears throat> um yeah <laughs> Does that mean that you don't record the drum parts? Um, last last album I recorded. This time it's all Ryan for, for the drum. Well, we'll talk a lot about the recording process yeah. in a little bit as uh, when Ryan talked about Do You Belong Here, we focus a lot on the recording style. So we'll definitely have to bring it back and do some pros and cons and contrasting. But like I said, we haven't spoken since July of 2019. What has the band been doing since then? What have, what have we done since then? Um, well, we kind of went on hiatus <laughs> as of August. So Tennis Elbow didn't really exist for a, a little bit, just because um, Heather and I moved to Brooklyn. I was going to say for what reason, but I guess for what reason did you move to Brooklyn? Uh, to follow our dreams. To follow our dreams. <laughs> and how's that going, I guess? It was bad. Kind of it's, <laughs> it's going very bad. It's actually, yeah. It actually couldn't be going any worse if you're at, if I'm being honest. Um, I we talked a little bit over the phone when setting up this interview, uh, and I said that I was interested in discussing what like the New York music environment is as compared to like North Carolina and specifically Wilmington, which is your place of origin for those who are unaware. Um, can you elaborate on that? Because when I originally brought it up, you said I could go on forever. So give it a shot. Well. I was really hoping that Heather would say yes, because that is a Heather question. Um, she is uh, she's in, in Brooklyn bands, and she has performed, and she is uh, in the know. And I think she could probably do a really succinct uh, comparison. Popcorn it to Heather, then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Um, I, yeah, it's, it's quite different. Um, I think in terms of sound, which is a given, but also just like, I don't know. It's. I think they're more. There's a there's a certain intensity with it. It's more intense. It's more uh, like these are these are people's livings. Like they're just musicians. That's all they do pretty much. They produce on the side and they play shows. Mm -hmm. Whereas like in Wilmington, you'll have like I work at Cookout, but I'm also in a band. So it's kind of like people people go to Brooklyn to have a career in music, and that's what they do. So that's what all they do. So it's pretty. It's really. It's really cool. I like it. When you say intense, could the word competitive also be used? Is that an apt description? Yeah, for sure. It's like, it's, I mean, it's hard to get to be on bills. It's hard to play shows. It's hard to maybe join a band and sort of, since there's so many people and so many bands, it's hard to make yourself seen. It's hard to, you know, be different. Um, but yeah, it's, it can be competitive for sure. You, uh, since you said that you like it, um, oftentimes when people talk about New York, you know, you hear the story of people moving there and following their dreams, as Ryan said, um, and then kind of getting like the New York burnout and saying like, this is too much for me. Um, even though it's intense and competitive, like, why do you like it so much? So I, I, I play a synthesizer in a, in a Brooklyn band called Assassin of Youth. And all, all the other band members are like Berkeley. A college of music graduates and I <laughs> have no formal training never I ever, never took any lessons so I'm <laughs> completely out of my element but being around all those extremely talented smart people in terms of music is just like it's mind-blowing it's addictive I guess this would be a pretty good transition considering the addictive nature um, any of you could answer this question how are you continuing to do music in quarantine um, well, I, I made an album. Um, <laughs> Which is why we're here today. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I kind of have like a manic energy. Um, I think the the band, which is evident that. on the album. Thank you. Um, uh, I I will take that as a compliment. No, that the band I think totally um, gets my manic energy, which is kind of why I like them so much. Because I'll go, hey, um, I have a thirty song rock opera I want to make, and they'll go, okay. Um, so <laughs> I, it, it does kind of it does kind of feel like. Um, you know, no matter what I kind of say, they'll be like, I'm down. Yeah, let's try it. You know, who cares? Um, but would you say writing this album is what kind of just like ended the tennis elbow hiatus? You just decided that you wanted to keep working on it, essentially? Well, yeah, I mean, Heather and I have been talking about the new tennis elbow album for months and months because I'll, I'll go I'll go into her room because we live across literally four feet from <laughs> each other. And I'll go, hey, Heather, um, I wrote a new song. And she'll go, cool, buddy. And then I'll get that, you know? So, um, yeah, I mean, like, I, I've definitely been writing these songs for a while, but um, the whole album was recorded under quarantine, um, which was a surreal experience for us um, from the get-go. It was, it's such a, such a weird, uh, such a weird atmosphere, but I think we made the best of it. Um, I hope so, at least. I have a lot of compliments for the album, so I'm very excited to discuss with y'all um, the making of it. Uh, I actually didn't know that it was made exclusively during quarantine. That's kind of a fast turnaround time. How long have you been writing the songs? Um, well, this is the longest turnaround time for any Tennis Elbow album by a lot. Usually we record everything in like two weeks and then the album is done like a week later. But this time I felt like I, I guess maybe I just had more to say than I did last time. And maybe I, I wanted to explore sonically more than I did last time. So uh, I have way longer. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I think that this album is really exciting. I think a rock opera is a good description of it. Um, I really enjoyed sitting and listening to it straight through at least once. Um, and there were there were moments where I was captivated because it was lush and deep in its sound and but also exciting and there were different dance parts and I audibly laughed at some of the transitions at how quickly they changed uh, but I really enjoyed listening to it <laughs> and I'm really excited to explore this album what was it like recording bass parts in different cities yeah it, it was interesting uh, Ryan called me oh geez I don't even know like a month ago maybe was it like I don't know maybe like a month ago and he was like, hey man, like, how's it going? Like, I have these songs. I wanted to like, you know, ask you if you wanted to do bass for it. Cause you know, obviously I'm not doing anything. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm just locked in my room and, you know, listening to the records and playing video games. So, you know, uh, yeah. And I was, I was like, oh, yeah, it'd be great. You know, it's awesome. Uh, I, you know, cause I haven't, you know, obviously done anything with, with either of those guys in a, in a while. So, uh, you know, he sent me the files over and it was actually pretty quick, um, you know, just, you know, hearing the songs and like writing the parts. And I remember, you know, actually sitting like right here, I would like rec use my like, you know, iPhone video recorder and be like, hey, man, like this is I think this is kind of cool. What do you think? And then you'd be like, oh, it's great. And, you know, after like a couple of days, you know, kind of get the parts down and send them back to him and, you know, take notes if I needed to and anything I needed to change. Did Ryan provide any like scratch bass tracks that for you to go off of like a general concept or was it entirely your writing? Not really. Uh, but the reason why I chuckled a little bit is because there was, I think, I forget which song we were working on, but he sent, <laughs> he sent me a voice memo of like what he's like, Hey man, can you do something like this? And it was just like, like, yeah, but like something he was, <laughs> I get it. It's probably the same like reaction I feel like someone who plays drums is like thinking about when I'm like, hey, can you do something that's like that? And you know, and they're just like, what? Um, but so <laughs> yes, and there was like some like a general like feel because I'm always very like over uh, analytical, I guess, about a lot of stuff. And well, you know, I don't want to be playing too much or I'm playing too little. So I sort of would would ask him as sort of a. Uh, a, a guiding force, if you will. Um, a puppet master. Yes. Yes. <laughs> wait, exactly. holding wait. the Wiimote. Check, you have it? <laughs> check this out. Um, this is uh, something that he sent me. If, if we can see it. Let's see if I can oh, see shit, that. that's right. Oh, yeah. So, okay. Wait, there's, I'm not gonna, I don't want to get too into it, but uh, he sent me one of the songs and 
for the life of me, this is terrible for promotion. I can't think of it. Ryan knows, I'm sure. Right? Oh yeah, no, it, it, it changed names three times. It's called Anytime now. Okay, <laughs> so it was that one. Um, so I'm, I'm a good, I'm a good band member. Um, and I was listening to it, and up to this point, I'd like you know heard the song, I like, got the feel for it. And there's this part in the middle where it kind of does this really weird like breakdown. The drums are all over the place. And at first I was like, man, am I just not that good? Like, am I, am I not picking up on like the time signature? And I, was, I sat here for probably an hour. I'm like listening to it. I'm like, okay, that's in six, eight. And I'm like, okay, now it just switches completely to like five, four. And so I ended up writing it down. I think I still have the paper here. So I'm like, yeah, it's, yeah. This is the, the paper that I used to write down the, the changes in time signatures, and it's probably not going to pick up on the camera, but it goes from like 6-8 to 5-4. There's other some chords here too. Um, and I was like, yeah, man, this is this is the time signature. I was like, I, I texted Ryan. I was like, yeah, like, what did you do for that? Like, how was, what was the thing? He's like, oh, dude, I have no idea. I just kind of did what I did. <laughs> like, oh, hey, cool. I'm a crazy person. <laughs> I love math rock. Truly, I do. Yeah. <laughs> Which I thought was hilarious, but and then uh, well, but it, I think it again. turned out great. I thought it was really cool that uh, you know it sort of floats and changes and shifts. Um, Which it is, is a like, good way very... to describe the album too. It has a lot of floating yeah. and changing and shifting, um, and I also think that's kind of a yeah. central theme about the album. Um, like there's a lot of historical references, and I I when listening to it could kind of draw some compare and contrast between the um, depth of writing that Ryan applied for Do You Belong Here to this new album, which we haven't even said the title yet. Go ahead and say it, Ryan. It's your cue. It's called Dropping a Han Dynasty Urn. Dropping a Han Dynasty Urn. But um, there is, there is a, lot of, there's a lot of change, um, particularly when you're advocating for change in um, Overton window swing, when you're talking about changing in relationship dynamics. Um, so tell me more about that historical theme. Like what was your thought process going into that? Um, well, uh, the thing that inspired the album um, was uh, Ai Weiwei's 1996, 19, no, 1995 series of paintings. He has, he, has, he has three paintings in a row where it shows him uh, holding a Han Dynasty urn. Um, and then the second one, Tim letting it go. And then the third one is the Han Dynasty urn shattering on the ground. And the Han Dynasty urn probably was worth around, around $2 million. Mm -hmm. And um, Ai Weiwei has a lot of other um, really amazing pieces where he's like taking ancient urns and uh, drawing Coca-Cola symbols on them. He said that the only way to build a new world is by destroying the old one. And so uh, that was uh, huge. That was huge for me. And so um, I said, yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> I love that. That's a really good. That's a really good philosophy, especially now more than ever when things are kind of going. To I did have to look up a lot of different things when listening to this album. Um, particularly, <laughs> my mom hates that. By the way, does she really? Uh, yeah, she 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 goes. I hate the names, and I think that you should make them things that people know because you seem like a, you seem like a jerk, and I wouldn't want to be your friend. And I was like, See, fair. That's very fair. Thank you, mom. My next comment could either support your mom or undermine your mom. Last <laughs> album cycle, we talked about your compare and contrast with Jack White, and then we also called him a pretentious prick for like fifteen minutes. And yeah, he, the, is, he is, but he's great. These <laughs> albums, these song titles are. Um, very Jack White. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. I um, I I I called I called um the songs like their names for like real reasons, but you know, looking at the track list, you go, oh, this sucks. I I hate this. <laughs> How do it's, I pronounce uh, uh like a third of this? Um, so. Do You Belong Here was your Lazaretto. This is your boarding house ranch. I, it has the same, obviously Jack White <laughs> is untouchable, so don't get a big head here. But <laughs> the, the progression from each album, um, I think is really comparable. And I can see uh, some inspiration there, uh, which I thought was cool comparing it to our last conversation about the album. Did you find it difficult to communicate these extravagant ideas to your band members? Yeah, especially to Heather, <laughs> because 
I, um, from the get go, you know, I knew that if I wanted to make it to a solo album in the next three or four months, that it would be very, very difficult to, you know, because our, our style of recording is we don't use BPM. Um, we, we don't do, like, we don't do anything that, like, would help us in a scenario where we're far apart. We, all, we always kind of record things together in okay. one space. So, um, you know, it was, there was just no way for me to convey what I thought the song should be. So I went and I recorded drums um, ahead of time, um, which was both a, a betrayal, but also um, kind of cool for Heather in the sense that she got to have a, a weirder uh, touch on this album that she doesn't usually have. And it's in a solo project, more akin to her Pinky Verde work in the sense that like, you know, it wasn't afraid to get a little wonky. Um, and, you know, I think that's why I like her her solo stuff so much and, and why I wanted her to be in the band in the first place is because she's a talented producer, a talented songwriter, and also not afraid to be weird as hell. And um, I respect that so hard. <laughs> oh, Heather, do you have any commentary on those descriptors? I, I remember Ryan first telling me about his like idea for the whole Han Dynasty thing. I thought it was, I love it. It's very fascinating. I, I love history and culture and stuff. Um, but, and I, 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 he said he wanted it to have sort of a Pinky Verde influence, I guess. And I can totally see that on like, like the, the, the five minute song. What's, what's that song called? Oh gosh, I should have <laughs> written that song minutes. name. It's called uh, Roger Moorcock. Yes, I actually have a reference to that uh, song in just a second. That, okay. that song definitely reminds me of like Pinky Verde because it, it goes on all these weird tangents and it's not structured really. And so that's, I dig it. The wonky The instrumentation on this album is kind of crazy. Um, I mentioned earlier that there were <laughs> transitions that made me like audibly laugh. And one of them was in Roger Moorcock. Um, I actually wrote down this little note that I'm going to read directly off the page. I said, um, stylistic maturity, really complex album. Instrumentation gets kind of crazy. In specifics, flute on Dinosaur and Intro and Roger Moorcock, the insane guitar sol solo on the second song, um, and then the space transition at the in the middle of Roger Moorcock. Uh, which kind of gave me some space oddity, David Bowie vibes, and then it just kind of like exploded back into um, like funk music. And I laughed at that. I had to. It was such a wild <laughs> change. Um, and so when you mentioned earlier that this album came out of like manic energy, I was like, yeah, it definitely did. But can you tell me more about who did the additional instruments, like the flute on this album, the extra vocals, the spoken word. There's so many little bits and pieces in, uh, in the making of this. I uh, got my friend Rhiannon, who has played saxophone on every Rhiannon solo Dewey, project. Rhiannon a classic. She is um, on a lot of it, but my friend uh, Joe, um, also Joe is his, is his artist name, um, he uh, is very talented. He, he does the, the chorus on the song Eurydice. Um, he sings in Roger Moorcock, part of the people screaming. Um, and his, uh, you know, uh, his, his girlfriend, um, the lovely Paige, um, she does the flute on Dinosaur and she does flute and saxophone on Roger Moorcock. And she's very talented. And she sings on, um, on Nero Diocletian. She does the, the backing The harmony and, part, yep. And then um, she does the, the chorus on Any Time Now. Um, uh, we'll still be happy anyway. She sings that. And then she also does the screaming in Roger Moorcock. So she is all over this thing. And then I asked my uh, comedy friend, uh, Julia Desmond, um, who I have always thought was the coolest person in the world. And I asked her out of nowhere, kind of out of like, literally I, I text her, can you send me a rant? I don't care what it's about, but just make it political. And she was like, yeah, I'll do that right now. <laughs> yeah, I got like, it. Immediately, right? And so like, I didn't feed her anything. I did not feed her any lines. I was just like, send me whatever you honestly think. And then I'll, I will put it on top of the song. And she was super down. And uh, I, I, it, it fits stupidly well. I'm so proud of it. Like I said, my, my thoughts go on regarding references I could make of like sonic similarities and changes between this album and your previous work. 
which by the way, I'm very excited to have explored um, all three of your albums at this point. Um, and the development of the three of you as musicians has been really fun to watch and explore. Um, speaking of Eurydice, which you brought up when describing the additional um, instrumentation, uh, it's a phenomenally lush song. I think it was perhaps my favorite song on the album. It's another historical reference that I went and Googled and was interested in the results. Um, but it was almost like a power pop ballad, sort of, which is, I think, a genre or trend that's really coming back right now. Do you have any specific uh, inspiration when writing that song? Or what are your thoughts behind that one specifically? Yeah, no, I, I wrote that song in 2017 for a band called Outline Skates. Um, and uh, I made a demo of it and I never did the vocals for it. I never recorded the vocals. But I was inspired because I uh, Jens Lechman has a a really great uh, debut record. Um, I forget the name of it, but it's really great. But Jens Lechman has a, a wonderful record, and um, kind of go off a little bit less about Eurydice and more about the song uh, uh, "Palisade Past You." I think you uh, you mentioned the guitar solo specifically at the end of that. Song. I did, um, yeah. And and the guitar solo was done by none other than Chandler Six on the guitar. <laughs> what? what is this? Plot twist. Don't know. <laughs> yeah, that was that was fun. Um, Ryan sent me a text and he said, "Make it like Prince," and I said, "I can't do that." Make it like Prince. Yeah, it was it was cool. I, I don't. I mean, I, I've played guitar longer than I played bass. Uh, probably 15, 16 years, and uh, it was kind of cool. I don't, I don't ever get to play guitar in any project, so it was kind of fun to, you know, bust that out and get some shredding going. <laughs> oh, and, and he delivered. He delivered so hard. Yeah. <laughs> um, do all three of you have, a, like, um, a heavy interest in 80s music? Just straight question like that. Yeah. No. No? <laughs> no. Heather doesn't know any music. That's, like, that's a famous music. fact about Heather. What kind, wait, what kind of 80s music? Um, I think it varies. When we when we talked about Do You Belong Here, we discussed specifically Olivia Newton-John's physical um, regarding mm. this album being, it's like I called it earlier, power pop. That's a, a, a genre that's coming back. You see it on um, Haley Williams' new album. And then Dua Lipa recently also ripped off physical from our last discussion. Um, and I think that the like the new wave stylings are really in right now. Um, and I wanted to know whether or not that was intentional or if you just really like a variety of 80s. You mentioned Prince and he made music in the 80s. And I quoted David Bowie earlier and he made music in the 80s. And Yeah, I mean, I, obviously there are a lot of artists in the 80s that... Um, there's a lot of music from there's the a 80s. Lot, there's a lot of music in the 80s, period, in the sentence. Um, I grew up on... I grew up on um, a lot of like suicidal tendencies and merciful fate and misfits and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So like my understanding of the '80s is mainly heavy metal. Um, but it wasn't until like uh, like five years ago or so that I really dived into Prince's discography. And um, obviously, David Bowie has a wonderful um, Let Let's Dance is a great record from mm -hmm. start to finish. An excellent record. Um, yeah. and, and obviously. Obviously, Chandler could talk your your head off about um, you know a black flag and all the Washington D.C. punksters, right? Oh yeah, that's all like all that stuff. I mean, that's why I asked like what '80s. I mean, obviously, there's not like a hardcore breakdown on on this record or anything. But, yeah, <laughs> there's all kinds of '80s stuff. Yeah, I, I grew up on all like the metal and the punk and all that like heavy stuff. But then like new wave and like synth pop and stuff is amazing. And like a lot of like you know. It, like Bowie, obviously, and Prince, for sure. Like, some It's amazing, not terribly you know. far off to quote 80s punk, though. Um, maybe it's not super evident when listening to the, to the album specifically, but um, 80s punk is very, like when you think of like hardcore as a genre, it's very reliant on a groove. You mentioned a breakdown and um, like the bass yeah. guitar and that backing, like lean into the music kind of feel is... Uh, was really developed in the 80s, whether it's disco or whether it's um, like hardcore, it's it's a, a common characteristic. And this album oh, yeah. 
dropping a, a Han urn is a Han Dynasty urn. I apologize. Is really reliant on reliant on you, Chandler. I like view the same breakdown in like a Slayer song with the same intensity as I view like a breakdown in like a Joni Mitchell song. Mm -hmm. Like it, it feels the same to me, which is yeah. probably you know weird for some people, but it's yeah, it's that like sort of that rhythm of it all that I you know really enjoy bringing because if it's not there then it's like what you know what is there I told Chandler on the phone and I, re I really I really meant it and I still mean it I told him that Kenneth Elbow is Chandler Hicks Chandler <laughs> Hicks is, is the backbone of Kenneth Elbow's groove you know what I mean like he, he really I, I, does bring I, it all together so <laughs> I have a note here. It's specifically under um, Overton Window Swing and Eurydice, but it says um, really, really emotive music, introspective, heavy and lush, contrasted with speedballing funk and Chandler being a wizard. Uh, and I wrote this down. So. <laughs> I was going to wear my cloak, but I thought it would be too much. <laughs> it's it's a little together. too flashy. You'd make me feel bad. Yeah, you know, I, I wouldn't want to, you know, overstep my. You know, Look, I changed out of pajamas for this interview. Be grateful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I actually, I, I misspoke when I said that I did all the drums for the uh, the record because Heather does play drums on Eurydice. Heather is also a wizard, so. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I think what was important for me about this this album was that Kenneth Selbo is, is a, I mean, for me, it's a 90s ironic Ben Folds cover band. Um, but it was important You've for me to. Always cited Ben uh, Folds. Oh, it's always been like I don't want Kenneth Elbow to have a a sound, but I want you to hear a Kenneth Elbow song and go, "That's Kenneth Elbow." Mm -hmm. um, like I don't I don't want to be in a, necessarily a, a one genre. Um, and like I said earlier, I've really enjoyed seeing these different influences come together across three albums. Um, kind of a grab bag question but do any of y'all have a specifically favorite moment on the album it's heather time i think it's heather time it's got to be heather time he heather's heard the whole album i my, my favorite moment i yeah i really like the end of overton uh, windows swing it's a that's what it's called right yeah I like, like at the very end, I don't know if you changed this, but when, when Julia says, Fuck. No, it's still there. I, okay. still there. I, I love that. That's six dollars. <laughs> that was one of the, the transitions that made me laugh. It was just very yeah. on the nose. It's hilarious. I love it. Yeah, it's so funny. And, and I cut her off right before she finishes the words, but I was like, she is so funny and delivered that so great that I was like, I can't not make that the end of the song. Like that's so perfect, right? <laughs> oh look, it's Chandler time as well. It's it's, it's I was see I was I was thinking very uh, very hard on on what my part was my favorite and like halfway through whoever was just talking because I was thinking so hard I couldn't even remember. Who was <laughs> I remembered uh, there's a saxophone part that Rhiannon does on um, now I'm blanking on the song. Uh, How's it go? The one the better overall? Overall? Yes. Oh my god. Okay, so the third, like the, the the last verse, like right before the chord changes, there's this part where she's like dun, dun, like the saxophone and it kind of lifts up the back half of the song. That shit is so good. <laughs> like that shit is so he, good. Like, he does this like I, 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 listen, oh. I listen to that song just to hear that saxophone part. <laughs> like I could take me too. Me, out of me too. Like that shit is so good. She's such a good like performer. Like oh my god. She sent me the sweetest text um, shortly after sending me all the all the files. Um, mm -hmm. That was that was along the lines of like um, I haven't touched my saxophone um, all of quarantine and I haven't been um, like artistically inspired in so long. But you giving me these crazy weird tracks and telling me to write whatever I want on top of them has been a blast. And so it, it's one of the rare times where you ask someone to do something and then they, then they go, thank you. And you go, no, 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 you, you, thank you. Oh my God, thank <laughs> you. Are you kidding me? Yeah. There's like so many good moments of, of like her just, you know, going to town. 
my my uh my favorite track is dinosaur on the album the very um, first track the very first track that's my favorite song because heather and i developed that song kind of together because that song is an, uh is initially on a ap we made it's called elite by cyberspace heartbreak which doesn't exist anymore right now but will eventually when i re-upload it to spotify um but uh yeah i i i was told by julia um she was on the album and had his girlfriend aforementioned um she told me out of nowhere that that was her favorite song that i've ever written and i had i was so like blo like i was so like oh that's the song okay um i guess i'll put that on a tennis double album then um so that's mm -hmm. the only reason it's on the album because i sent that i sent the album to chandler chandler did his bit um i i, I sent you know the it, it to Paige and she did her her flute um, and then I sent it to Heather at the very end and Heather made the track. Heather literally made that track. And it's my favorite part of the album to listen to, honestly. So damn good. <laughs> I love the excitement you all have for each other as musicians. It's a really like tangibly warm friendship and like intercollaboratory relationship. It's really cute. I really like it. <laughs> Um, what was the most difficult part about making this album? I was going to say the, the, the most difficult part for me was not being able to actually be with the both of you guys like jamming on it because that's like one of my favorite like parts of like, a, you know, playing with with anybody really, but specifically with y'all is just like, because, you know, the music is so intricate and, uh, you know, very uh, explosive at times with, you know, chords and melody and stuff it's really fun to kind of get you know in person obviously you know with this quarantine uh pretty hard to do that but i i thought that was probably the most not difficult but it was it was uh you know it's like oh man I don't get frustrating to, you know. yeah i think in the beginning of the album cycle i said heather brings an energy on her drumming that i do not possess in my drumming so i felt like that was an immediate loss for the record with the, that that Heather wasn't, uh, you know, laying down the entire backbeat. Um, mm -hmm. I, I felt I felt like that that was to the, the detriment of the album. Heather has always said that I am a weird drummer, um, <laughs> and, and this album is no exception. This is actually probably the weirdest drumming I've done. Ever. I agree. I agree with that <laughs> statement. Hardly. It's good. It's really good. It is really good. But very I, weird. It's very weird. You know, I I drum um, like a robot. You know, you know, like, yeah, like, yeah, you know, I mean? like, yeah, I, you know, like how Stevie Wonder hears the song in his head, and it's, and yeah. he'll go, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna make a beat for it, and I know exactly how to do it. For me, I can, like, when I do the song in my head, I change the drum beat for the verse because I know, like, in my head, I'm like, oh, it changes here when I when I do the piano, so I'll change it here, um, and it barely goes together, um, ever. Um, <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, it's funny like, you say that. Cause like, I remember like listening to some of the tracks and you know, sometimes there will be hits, you know, in certain rhythmic patterns that you definitely want to like emphasize with the bass. But normally for like verses, they're usually like the same kind of like hits. And I remember like recording it, you know, I've heard, I, I, you know, a number of songs and okay, it's like, okay, this is that. And then I kind of, you know, want to syncopate <laughs> with it. But then there's like, it yeah. switches it up so many times, <laughs> which is like interesting. It makes me go, but then it's like, I'll, I'll think it's going to hit it. And then it like is, there's a, it hits it like on the and one or something, you know, it kind of goes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which I thought was, it was cool because it kind of switches up the, you know, the rhythmic uh, feel of it. But it was also just like, oh, okay. It kind of makes me, that's uh, another thing, like why I like playing with, you know, with Tennis Alvo and like playing a lot of Ryan. Chandler, I miss you. I miss you too, Heather. Oh, I, I want to like hang out, but like all this, all this junk, all these diseases. Um, Wait, but there's what? But yeah, like one of, the, one of the reasons why like I enjoy it is because it kind of makes me sort of uh, play outside of this this field that I kind of normally find myself in as like a bass player. Um, you know, I'm, I'm in a couple other projects, and it's. I'm not, I'm not gonna say it's simple, obviously, like I, you know, want to bring a sort of complexity to it, to whatever I'm doing, but, you know, I'm not gonna play, you know, like a, 
six, eight, like waltz or something with, you know, several different chord changes and, you know, things, which is like, I love listening to all that kind of music, you know, with all these, you know, like Ryan mentioned Stevie Wonder and like having all these like different parts and chords. Like I love, I love a good chord progression. And uh, I think playing with, you know, these guys is, is helpful in that it kind of gets that, you know, gets that part of me to like be expressed and be like, oh, I can just lay down some, you know, like a cool doodad. <laughs> a cool doodad. <laughs> he yeah. does, if anything, he does too many things. Is I do too many things. Issue. So yeah. many that's things. The thing. Like you were saying with, with the, uh, like the manic energy that like you have and that like is yeah. obviously noticed. I'm in the same way. Like I have to be like almost to a fault, you know, doing something like either making like programming drums or like noodling on like a guitar or, you know, consuming something. So I think it's, it's good. You know, you can kind of hear it on the record too, but I think it's, it's good that like both of those energies are kind of together. Does that make sense? I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I've actually been thinking through much of this interview that uh, it's it's clear that uh, the three of you have worked together for a very long time. Um, the same goes for like working with Rihanna and Dewey. There's just so much of this album that like could not have happened had you not had all this experience together. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of it that seems to have just like fallen into place. You both being like manic at the same time, Ryan just like having a concept, executing it and have willing partners who are like, open to working on it it just i'm gonna i'm gonna say it phenomenal i'm gonna say it <laughs> <laughs> now we've talked about this album a lot but we haven't noted the release date when does everyone else get to hear it okay uh the first it, it drops in three parts just like the um i way way um piece um it drops uh the first one is called the drop um and that comes out uh, may 21st and then the fall, which is the second EP, comes out uh, June fourth, and then uh, the final album dropping a Han Dynasty urn with all the tracks at once. Um, I think it's a ten track album altogether. Uh, comes out uh, like June eighteenth, I think is the date. Yeah, the day before my birthday, June. Yeah, on <laughs> two purpose. days before on my purpose. little sister's birthday. <laughs> this is all on purpose. I did this all on purpose. All on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> um, very very stoked for this album to be shared with the world um like i said i cannot say enough good things i was really engaged with the whole thing and um am captivated by the complexity that you were able to shove into a 10 song package in like less than two months crazy love the cow heather <laughs> that is Having a good a cow, cow. Elbow had a rule before this that we would never do since um and then i was like i want to do that now <laughs> so I broke yeah. my only rule. Um, and then I, uh, you know, I, I even sampled, like I sampled Heather's drums and I sampled um, Fix Me on the first track, Dinosaur. I love that. I love um, that. Thank I you. heard that and I was like, oh, snap. Uh, like a throwback. Sorry. Throwback. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I mean, like this, this, this album was mainly just about breaking my own rules and, and trying to be uncomfortable. Um, breaking your own urn. Timmy Solvo is going to release the album in about a month, um, a little bit over a month. Um, but until then, I guess I'm just going to sell my soul to, to music marketing, which is a soulless hellscape, by the way. Music marketing. We learned about awful. that on uh, the song Streaming on Do You Belong Here. Oh my God, it's horrible. Oh, I didn't miss it. That, if anything, that's why I didn't want to make another Timmy Solvo album so soon was because I, I remembered how horrible creating content to market it was. I was it's like, that, that music industry burnout. We talked about it. Oh, I hate it. Yeah, no, it's, it's awful. I think I think every band is, is kind of in that dilemma where they're like, we want to keep making stuff, we want to keep performing, and and it, it's becoming very clear that that is uh you know not going to be the same uh, as it used to be for a while. So that that right. so it, it's creating art at all right now. If, if you're a musician, um, you can make the art in your in your like living room in your in your basement right um but in regards to like marketing the art in regards to you know reaching people in regards to uh, performing it's i mean like your kind your hands are tied it's it's it, it, it's it's awful i mean like i i want nothing more than to be with these boys out performing and, and playing these new songs and 
and uh, and making that happen. And I, I know that team player feels the same way in subtle pause and all of them feel the same way. Oh, yeah. So I, um, okay. and I, I think I think that that is a shared sentiment for all, all the all the artists right now. Um, and so on that note, I really appreciate all three of you talking with me today, particularly considering that it is uh, my first local beat digital session. Um, I think it went phenomenally well and I've really enjoyed uh, as I've said repeatedly getting to explore dropping a, a Han Dynasty urn. Um, really really exciting album really really wonderful so thank you very much for being here today. Any final uh, questions comments or concerns? It's funny that we're talking about like not being able to perform and the whole music scene and stuff because uh, weirdly enough there's a, a project that's been put out by quite a few uh, local uh, local to Wilmington artists that um, we all kind of collectively did over the past month or so. Uh, the quarantine sessions that we, um, I know Tennis Elbow's on it, Two Tree Hill's on it, uh, Pinky Verde's on it. Uh, yeah. Pinky Verde! Team, team players on it for sure. Um, and a, lot, a bunch of other like local bands. Uh, so if if anybody wants to hear some cool music, it's definitely on Bandcamp, and there's been some hiccups getting it on streaming services, but all of the proceeds go to Nourish NC, which I believe Correct. is a local food bank. In yeah, town. yeah. Yes. Um, so it, it's, a, it's supporting a good cause. Uh, it was started up by Marty uh, Cunningham of Team Player. Um, we kind of just got together. So if you know anybody wants to check out, you know, obviously any Tennis Elbow stuff or Pinky Verde stuff or any other kind of music of that, you know, realm, definitely go check that out. And, and they're like exclusive tracks too that are yeah. not on the album. Yeah, they're not. That, that's the cool thing. Um, but yeah, you go to quarantinesessions.bandcamp.com to, uh, to do that. I think, I think it's $7 um, and nice. obviously all the money, all the money goes to, um, to the Nourish and see, I think it's like 20 tracks. It's like insane. Um, yeah, it's a, an awesome album. But yeah, no, uh, the album comes out June 18th. There are two EPs that drop before it. And, uh, and I don't want to be marketing it anymore. So if anyone, if, if anyone wants to be, um, you know, my manager, I am all ears, please. <laughs> um, so on that note, thank you so much for talking with me today. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> You're very welcome.